Today on Locked on Suns, draft night one is over. The Phoenix Suns traded back and still got their guy. We'll break down Ryan Dunn from Virginia, the move the Suns made, and what to expect on Thursday. Coming up next. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team, Every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Brendan Clean, your host. Welcome in. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen post NBA draft night one. Happy Thursday. Night two awaits. But we got a lot to talk about in the meantime. We are free and available everywhere, including YouTube, folks. So if you're finding us for the first time or you just haven't done it before, go ahead and hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you're finding us. Get a new episode in your feed every Monday through Friday. This week, you're getting even more than that. Who knows what's going on with Summer League? The point is, episodes galore, five at least, every single week to kick off your day and get you locked onto the Phoenix Suns all year long, but especially this busy, newsy time of year here in June and July in the NBA. Joining us, as he does every week, to help recap this draft night is Stephen Perjon Garner. He is a writer at Bright Side of the Sun, PHNX, CHGO. And joins us once a week here. Steven, uh, I'm very much looking forward to talking with you about Ryan Dunn because I think you and I are a little split on him, or at least a little split on it being the Suns' best option. We'll get into that next. Today's show, guys, brought to you, though, by the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app today, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA when you do to get $20 off your first purchase. Caitlin Clark coming up Sunday, Mercury. We got the All Star game. Yeah. Lots of stuff going on in the Valley. Check it out at game time. All right. The Suns started the night with the 22nd overall pick, Stephen. They now uh, select Ryan Dunn with the 28th overall pick. We'll talk about the trade in the next segment, but sell me on Dunn. Sell me on why you like him, what you think he brings to this team, and uh, what he can, how he can fit here now that he is going to be a, a rookie for this group. Yeah, it's the, it's the raw athleticism. And just the ability to be a wrecking ball in a sense defensively. Uh, from my particular position on the wing, it's a three-four tweener, to where there's a ton of ton of ton of defensive versatility that Mike Budenholzer and company will be able to lean into with uh, with sustained impact in terms of consistency uh, from him. Now, yes, he's not he's not a perfect player. He's not a player without flaws, but I feel like his strengths are loud enough to allow for him to be almost ready now to play in terms of having a uh, back-end part of the rotation type of role with the team that does have will now aspirations like the Phoenix Suns. And in addition to all of that, to get assets in terms of more picks in the draft while also being able to trade back multiple picks and still get your target is it's truly a, it's a grand slam. And I think because getting the type of player that can have the type of defensive impact that Dunn will have on the NBA level, he's very much a ready now NBA defender on the wing. It's like at that, at that position in the draft, it's, it's just a grand slam, man. Definitely think, you know, everything you said physically. I mean, he, he is a lot of people have called him, and I'm sure Suns fans have heard this by now as he's been in the mix and we know they worked him out and everything else. Analysts who, who break down this draft stuff all year, every year, have called him one of the best defensive prospects in recent memory like that that's what we're dealing with here right so very good starting point physically six six uh just over six six without shoes listed at six eight at virginia you add a couple inches that makes sense but the wingspan seven one and a half you know like Tijon salon got picked early in this draft at six he's a a big man more more of a of a typical kind of could play some four maybe some five whatever he has a smaller wingspan than ryan dunn dayron holmes who got selected where the Suns uh, obviously were originally picking. Kind of a 4-5 tweener, maybe we'll see. Smaller wingspan than Ryan Dunn. So that's that's kind of the, the physical tools that he has on top of having the tape to back up his defensive prowess. So I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be great. I mean, at, on that side of the ball. And I'll admit, you know, I'm not, the intricacies of, of what it will take for an offensive player or for a defense-first prospect to 
cut it on offense enough to survive on an NBA floor. You're talking about intricacies. You're talking about does he have field? Can he, um, you know, move the ball in an intelligent way? Can he cut and finish and make shots from other places and, and just add up enough, kind of like the Gary Payton the second litmus test, right? Can he do enough of those other little things? Maybe knock down enough threes here and there. To, and so I don't know if he can do all of that. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. I look forward to breaking down more tape and watching him at Summer League. But that's the big question, right, is can he do enough of those things on the other side of the floor, even on a team with superstars like the Suns have, to not just be you know, playing four on five on that end and really holding the team back? Yeah. That is that's the that's the big question mark for Dunn as he transitions to the to the NBA level. But I will say that just in the film that I've watched of him, I don't feel like that his offensive uh, his offensive deficiencies are as loud as other people might say that they are. I see a player in Ryan Dunn that has the requisite the requisite size to have a different type of impact as a cutter. Like there's one thing if you understand how to make scripted cuts and how you how to make read and react cuts in your six two six three, those cuts hit a whole lot different when you're six six and you have that seven one and a half wingspan and you have a, a a vertical leap that's I don't know off the top of my head but surely above thirty seven inches. <laughs> like when you have those type of impact stature numbers and physical uh, measurables about your game. Combined with the processing speed to understand the scenarios as to when and the timing at which and the timing of how to cut and do different things on the margins in that capacity, I feel like gives you opportunity to have impact past just shooting. Naturally, you have to see if you can get more out of him as a screener and as a roller and then naturally integrating in the short role playmaking dynamics and things of that nature to get more value out of him for the things that he can't do in terms of the shooting and being a threat outside of the three point line. But I do think that his defense will allow for him to mask some of his weaknesses on offense because when he's on the floor in transition, whether he has the ball after a deflection or a steal or he's filling one of the lanes, that's also where he's uh, optimized. You get to get the most out of his athleticism. He provides you with some vertical spacing. And I think he's going to be a player that, is, even as a rookie, is going to be able to uh, process the game well enough to put together a handful of those uh impactful sequences where he's doing something and causing chaos on defense, rim protection secondarily, on the ball with deflections, jumping in the passing lane, and then getting out on the other end and giving this team a lot of what they missed last season. Uh, max vertical leap, uh, 38.5 inches, there you which go. is higher than uh, Matas Pazelis, who is supposed to be this you know guy who's about to go win a dunk contest, and uh, <laughs> Alex Saar, who went number mm -hmm. two overall. So... You know, it, we're talking about a, a really high-level athlete, a really physically gifted dude, and somebody whose defense is is going to translate. And that's a, an amazing starting point, again, at number 28 in the draft. On the offensive side, 68.5% finishing at the rim this year at Virginia on, on a, a legit number of attempts, um, 130. So pretty good. I mean, very good. Um, and then this weird wrinkle where he made his two point jumpers. Now he was only 19 of 54. So I don't want to, or 18 of 43. Sorry. So I don't want to make it as if it was a, a really high volume. There's also these rumors that his shooting looked a little bit better in the workouts that he did pre-draft yeah. than maybe mm -hmm. at Virginia. Mm -hmm. We'll see. You know, I don't want to say no, I'm not telling you to ignore that, but also like, come on, you know, uh, it's the pre-draft process. If we believed every single thing that God said, uh, by reporters and whatnot this time of year, we'd think everybody was either great or awful and no in between. So I'm not going to fully uh, buy in. But the other weird part of all of it is 53% at the free throw line. And I mentioned this on uh, on Tuesday's show, I want to say, where Sam Vecini of The Athletic, whose draft stuff is definitely the most in-depth of anybody's yes. and, and really goes deep. And, yes, you know, he, that was he yeah, very much so. Uh, live stream throughout this entire draft while also live blogging the draft for The Athletic, I believe. So, you know, um, there you go. But um, he, he had this observation that I mentioned on the on the show the other day, which was basically that on top of everything else, Dunn got a little bit tentative toward the end of the season and kind of stopped playing to his strengths on offense at all and just wasn't really taking shots and and 
So, you know, that speaks to a lot of it being situation. We know if you're looking for offensive maximization, you don't even have to be talking about Ryan Dunn or 2024 to know that Virginia is not that. Never has been, never will be on the offensive end. So, you know, you could easily make a case the offense will will come along. We'll have plenty more time to talk about Dunn, uh, including to close out the week. We'll have to cut it there because we got to talk about the dra- the trade that got them to the number 28 overall pick, what they did not select, what they chose to get value-wise with that trade, and whether we like the move. We'll talk about that next. First, today's show brought to you by Game Time, the best place to buy any ticket in the authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier for baseball as well as everything else. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer to first pitch, and they have tons of deals like that. No matter what event you're po- you're buying for, concerts, theater, comedy, and of course sports of uh, on top of that, that's what we're all here for. But maybe that other stuff appeals to you. <laughs> Flash deals, zone deals. You got uh, all-in pricing, which at least is just honest about what the price is even going to be in the first place. Then, of course, those those last-minute deals, saving up to 60% off, buying last-minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Again, WNBA All-Star, Caitlin Clark this weekend. The Diamondbacks are going. The uh, soccer is coming here for the tournament later in the summer. Download the GameTime app, create an account, use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first pitch purchase across all kinds of events. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code locked on NBA, L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute pickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All righty, Steven. So let's talk about this trade. The Suns, as we heard for a while now that they were interested in doing, traded back, ended up being with the Denver Nuggets who made a promise a while ago, even longer ago than we knew the Suns wanted to trade back. We knew the Nuggets like Daron Holmes. He is a Phoenix native, so kind of a funny wrinkle there. They move from 28 to 22. The Suns go back to 28, and they get 56, as well as Denver's 2026 and 2031 second-round picks. Um, I want to hear your thoughts. Before uh, we get too far, though, I do just want to compare that just so we get it all out there for to the other move backs that we saw so the knicks moved from 24 to 26 and got 51 this year and then they moved 20 the 26th pick this year they didn't move back they just moved out for five seconds and we don't know for sure at least i haven't seen exactly what those are Mm -hmm. so it feels like the suns kind of got a reasonable value compared to those other teams i mean they got the two futures which the knicks didn't get with washington so I guess in this tr- in this draft, that was kind of the price of doing business, and the Suns got fair value. What do you think? I think fair value is an accurate assessment of it uh, from my from my perspective as well. I like that they gained some assets in terms of uh, some draft capital for a team that is uh, needless to say the well is dry in that sense for this team, just kind of projecting forward. So having some more optionality with the picking that you do have at your disposal in this upcoming draft is is very relevant. I think it's something that we're going to see them uh, might potentially see more uh, moves to come tomorrow with those picks that they were able to gain asset wise. Um, very curious what that where that lands with them as far as uh, everything pertaining to players that we've spoken to before, like Bronny James, et cetera, et cetera, and how all of that kind of fold, uh, unfolds tomorrow. It's going to be very interesting to follow, but I do think that they put themselves in a position. Uh, to make some things shake in terms of adding some more um, youthful exuberance to everything that they're yeah. doing and to also tandemize that with them having their own G League affiliate now to keep those talents in-house as well. I think it's relevant to speak on this uh, in addition to that. Yeah, I mean, I could see Dunn getting some minutes down there. Uh, maybe the guy they take at 56 ends up being um, a two-way player. We don't know. But as far as the value, I, I think it's – whether you're thinking of it from the standpoint of adding the extra pick on Thursday in round two or just the ability to have those future picks at your disposal in future moves. I mean, we saw how valuable that was with Royce O'Neal. The Suns still had two left over to trade before tonight. Now they have two more. 
you know, we, like I said, that Knicks deal that they did with the Thunder, that was five seconds. The Suns now have four they can use, including, I guess, five if you count the one that's this year. So those do, those are a currency in the NBA, even if you got to add a bunch of them up to actually get to something meaningful. They have enough to do that now, and that's a good thing. The 2031 pick from Denver, I think, is particularly valuable just because with seconds, it's kind of a crapshoot anyway, but the way I think about it, similar, I mean, it's the same really as first, is just... How far out can you go? Nikola Jokic will be 36 years old in 2031. That Nuggets team will look very different. If I'm trading that pick now, that has a decent amount of value just because the Denver situation could be in a rebuild or, or something close to it. That pick could be 35, you know, so uh, all around good stuff. Let me ask you this. Is done, you, we were texting kind of right before the pick and then it ended up being done right after that, but... Was he the number one guy, regardless of how things shook out? Like if they had stayed at 22 and some of the other guys we knew were in the mix were still available, would you still have wanted Dunn? Or were there other players you like more that just kind of went before the Suns and then Dunn you were like thrilled about just as kind of maybe like a plan B or C? Well, Dunn was originally like a plan B-ish type of player for me. Yeah. I I personally had an affinity for Tristan De Silva. I didn't know if the silver would actually fall all the way to the Suns because I felt like he was the type of player that fit for a team that he ultimately got picked by, by the Orlando Magic. But if he didn't get picked by the Magic, I could also very well have seen him ended up with the Cleveland Cavaliers in terms of fitting the archetype that they need in context with everything that now Kenny Atkinson is going to desire to do, but also to do around the margins with everything with Evan Mobley and Donovan Mitchell and if Darius Garland is still there. He fits that. He checks off a lot of boxes for that team. So I felt like he wouldn't make it to the Suns. But he was a player that was going to be in that realm where if they traded up, maybe they potentially would have a chance to draft him. Ultimately, we see where he ended up with the Orlando Magic. Uh, kudos to him. But Brian Dunn, uh, that was definitely like my maybe, if I say like top four, he would probably be like my maybe fourth player on that list. The other big player for me, and I didn't think he would make it to the Suns unless they traded up a lot too, was Devin Carter. And there's a lot of just, mm -hmm. just prolific, prolific athleticism coming from the guard position, being able to play both positions, even that smaller, at a smaller stature. Uh, just little things like that where Devin Carter really stood out on film to me. Um, but yeah, Ryan fits. Ryan has a little bit of what Tristan as well as um, as well as um, Devin Carter bring to the table in terms of the things that I was looking at. Just a, a certain type of motor in a certain type of archetype to give this team a different type of flavor and identity to kind of lean into when that player is on the floor. Did you have anybody else in, in mind for you? Um, I'm, I'm, you weren't too high on them when we had the conversations initially. I'm curious yeah. who else was on your mind. I mean, that's the thing. I'm trying not to be too negative. I know people are excited. We haven't had a draft pick around here in four years. So, <laughs> yes. But, I look, I don't think Dunn is I, – I, I'm not trying to, to rain on it. I actually, like – I think long term, I feel great about him. I mean, again, to reference Sam uh, Vecini from The Athletic, who he compared him, and I mentioned this when I talked briefly about Dunn. See, I, I should, I, even if I may not be a big fan, I did, I will take like a small victory lap that I saw this coming because I was like, we're getting toward Wednesday, and I've not talked enough about Ryan Dunn, and I think he might be the pick. So I did a whole <laughs> segment on him after talking rambling like a lunatic about kevin durant and the rockets for 25 minutes i was like oh let me just goodness. throw a done thing in here because i think we gotta we gotta hit it so i thought this could happen and i'm not not upset about it that comp i was gonna say from sam though was he's he he has said like derrick jones jr and maybe it's not a one-to-one -one, no no comp is ever one-to-one -one, but suns fans watched DJJ early on in his career and we could all see that he had NBA potential not just because of the freak athleticism and the size and the frame but also he he wasn't lost with the ball in his hands even as a 19 year old coming out of a UNLV program that's nobody's idea of a blue blood he he just looked the part as far as how he played and had an IQ to him but it took a while and a lot of these guys it takes a while and so that's the part of this that I get a little bit nervous about because the Suns don't exactly have patience on their side right now. Matt Ishbia has not uh, given us any reason to think he has patience. We know the pressure on this team to win. We know the ages of the players involved and every the money that they're making and all that stuff that Suns fans don't need me to tell them. So that's really the downside of it for me. If the Suns were in a rebuild, I'd be all about done. Give, you know, Let me watch him in summer league. Let me see him get 18 minutes a game and 
I'll go to Tempe and watch him in the G League, but all that out of the way to say, I would have personally, even with how the board broke down and everything else, I really liked Eve Misi. If he would have been available, it would have been him for me, but it felt like New Orleans had eyes on him for a while now. They end up picking him right before 22 at 21. So I would have gone Tyler Kolick. And I think, you know, people feel different ways about him, but at the very least, I know that, I know what he is. I know he can contribute early, but he also does have a ceiling on top of that. He's not some, you know, basically free agent that you're drafting you know he he, he is a prospect i think he has a, a room uh, to get better but he fit more of what i think the suns not more of what they need if done hits he's what they need too but he filled a kolik would have filled a big need and i just felt more confident that at least on the course of that rookie contract he was going to contribute whereas the track record tells us guys like dunn even if they eventually are you know starting in the nba finals like derrick jones how long ago did he get drafted? Six, seven years? That that sometimes is how long it takes. That that just makes me nervous. Yeah, I, I feel that. I feel that. I think um, I think you mentioned DJJ. I think that's appropriate for Dunn. Another name that I've seen tossed around in terms of comparisons, which are always fun to kind of gauge, was Herb Jones. And yeah. the fact that the fact that Ryan Dunn is considered by many of the people that uh which definitely want to give a hat tip to all the people that do their work in earnest with the draft because this is not easy in any capacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the people that I respect that have opinions about the draft have said that they think Chris Dunn, Chris Dunn, Ryan Dunn, excuse me, Chris Dunn, also very good at defense. They said they think Ryan Dunn is the best defender in this draft and has the potential to be that in spades. And I think that's something that is very appealing to this Suns team that needs that defense, again, from that particular position. And then my other thing with, with Collect, I certainly like his game a lot. My question comes with a smaller guard that isn't a threat in terms of pull-up shooting, and we see how much how much of an importance that is coming for primary ball handlers in the league now. You add the deficit uh, in terms of stature that he's going to be up against in addition to the three-point shooting wall or the general pull-up shooting wall. Does that impact ultimately his bread and butter, which was getting the paint touch and playmaking off of that? And I kind of look at that and I compare that weakness to – Ryan Dunn's weaknesses in shooting is just the general attention he's going to garner on the perimeter. And I feel like the the ace and all of that is going to be the defensive versatility that, that Ryan Dunn is going to provide you because I feel like that's going to be a little bit more easy to translate to the NBA yeah. level. And I feel like that's going to be something that can be as impactful as anything else that could be added from any archetype for this Phoenix Suns roster at the moment, moment given they have the talents that they do at the top of it. Yeah, I mean, if, if Kolek is not able to generate advantages and be an offensive engine in the half court because of his athletic limitations and he's smaller. And if the strength doesn't really translate, you know, in an NBA environment like it somewhat did uh, in college and the finishing doesn't go there either, you add all those up and, you know, that that's a, a very negative version of what he could turn into. But if, if all of that stuff's even 20% worse, you're talking about a guy who also might not be playable at the NBA level, right? So it's not as if Kolick was a sure thing. If if he was a sure thing point guard, at least a backup who could be more, we wouldn't have been talking about him at 28. He went undrafted today, right? So like that, you know, it, there is risk there too. And so that's a good point. And yeah, the Herb Jones comp, just to 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 respond on that one too, because it's been, you know, that that's not, um, that's been out there too. And I, and I get it, but Herb was a do-it-all guy especially as a senior he was a point yeah, forward for, sure. for that alabama team right and like sure. you know even if even if the shooting didn't come along for him mind you also i believe not a first round pick right so like um and some mm-hmm. of that's just years and everything but he went later and had proven more he had a 108 108 assists to 93 turnovers as a senior turnovers were high but that assist number is nice to see the the free throw shooting was at 71 he really really grew over four years maybe done if he stayed till he was a senior we would feel differently and and again you're talking about in the nba maybe in two years he is that but it's uh it's tough it's a, it you know it's it a dice a, roll. A, it's a dice roll right and it's a weak draft even at, in the late part like i think we can, can kind of convince ourselves where well if the if the top's weak you can still get guys in the back. Well, it's like, well, no, there's a trickle down all the way. You're, you're picking in the twenties. You're picking a guy who might normally be in, you know, in Herb's case, 35 or in the forties. So 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is what it is. But all right, let's jump to Thursday. Look ahead a little bit, talk about what the Suns might do at 56 if they're done making moves in general. All coming after one more quick break. All right, Steven. So, uh, of course, I think people's heads kind of turned when the Suns landed at 56, which, of course, is one pick behind the Lakers at 55, where we have all expected Bronny James to go for weeks. Has that dream died? Is Bronny going to be a Laker and the Suns, the Suns can just, uh, we can all just kind of move on from that whole saga? Ah, I don't know, man. It remains to be seen. <laughs> uh, it remains yeah. to be seen. Remind me, what pick did the Suns garner? Uh, with that with that transaction, was it fifty one? I can't well, remember. Was fifty one? Wait, hold was on, 51? hold on here. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yep, yep. Okay, fifty one. Okay, so now that makes things interesting because it was well noted, which we talked about on our most recent uh, episode here last week, that Bronny only worked out for two teams. I think those, I think those kind of tree leaves with the situation surrounding Bronny and, you know, how teams are evaluating him and the teams that he actually worked out for now becomes interesting because needless to say, we just heard recently earlier this week that the Lakers are looking to pick him in their second round with their second round pick at 55. Um, the, the Suns now have it at 51st. I'm curious if that's going to have trickle down effect in reaction. With Hold the on. Lakers it, is it. it is 56. It is 56. Is it 56? It's 56. Okay. So I'm looking at Tankathon's uh, draft that's order. They have the Suns. Yeah, that's where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm looking that's, at. Too. That's hilarious because I, I pulled that up as well, and I'm like, yeah. they didn't have 51 heading into the night. That's not yeah. the pick they acquired from Denver. Right. Where did that come from? Because Denver's right. still sitting there at 56. So mm -hmm. it is 56. Um, mm -hmm. That makes it that makes it interesting. I'm curious like how that's going to shake out. And that's why I mentioned yeah. earlier um, – when speaking of speaking about Dunn initially, I was curious if the Suns were going to try to make another move with the picks that they or with the assets they acquired to try to get ahead of the Lakers. What's the jousting going to look like there? I think it's going to make for one of the more intriguing second rounds that we've seen uh, in recent memory tomorrow. <laughs> well, I thought the Suns were going to potentially trade back again at twenty eight. Now, I you know I, I'm sure now that now that we know it was done and and there was so much noise there, maybe I was just wrong on that but um it is kind of interesting on top of what ended up happening with you know their trade and everything else and i mentioned Misi, but even jalen tyson went a little bit higher than we thought yeah. and yeah it started to just be like all right they might not be able to you know really wait much longer here mm -hmm. but so okay i'm looking at the guys that they've worked out they drafted or they they worked out a ton of unranked guys maybe mm -hmm. to fill out their summer league roster or uh to be for the g league team that stuff happens but aj mitchell didn't get drafted right i don't think so so they oh, worked wait, him wait, out did he? Did he? Did i don't he think he did i don't think so i don't think so yeah and so they worked him out they worked the um g league forward tyler smith out Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, Kolik is still there, and I—I I don't know. I, I don't. It would feel a little bit silly to just package everything they just got back from Denver just to move up again. Mm -hmm. I don't really want them to do that for Bronny, but I don't know. I wouldn't. It probably wouldn't be everything. But again, remember they still also have the other two seconds in their back pocket that they w went into this whole thing with. I don't know. It would not shock me if if they made another move, got back into the second round a little bit higher than fifty six, mm -hmm. picked one of these numerous players that because there were a lot of reaches in that first round are now still available, and maybe they signed some of these super late guys that were thinking, okay, maybe that could be at fifty six. Maybe those guys just become undrafted free agent signings anyway, and you know summer league and G league signings. You don't need to draft a guy to get that. So. I don't know. If they can, I think they they will try to. But again, just like we talked about heading into the first round, you got to find the partner. Yeah, that's the that's the tricky part. Cause like, I, we can say that we assume they're going to make some type of move in some capacity. But the other part of it is you have to find somebody that's willing to do it with you, you know? And yep. 
it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how, especially given the context of this draft, like you said, like you prefaced with not being the strongest, we're getting into the second round now. What teams are gonna value those picks early in the second round versus who's gonna just kind of be like, eh, okay, we can do this move. Um, and if you can find that partner in time for whatever pick that you're trying to get X player at to be available. So I'm gonna be it's gonna be fun watching just kind of the chess moves going on in the second round tomorrow. And um, I think it's going to be a uh, precursor to everything that we're going to be seeing in terms of moves to come with uh, free agency coming up uh, going into next week. Is there another player you like that we haven't hit on or, or anything that, that could be available that you would want to see them go after? Nah, at this point, I'm just very much kind of it's whatever. Uh, you, draft, you draft what's available and then you evaluate it over summer league and then you kind of assess yeah. from there. Um, I mean, Kolek would be nice, but I think that's it's impossible for them to even pick him at this point unless they traded up that high into the second yeah. round, which, I mean, it's not impossible, but I think it's improbable more than it is possible for them to make that happen. So that's kind of where I'm yeah. at now. How about you? What you thinking? Yeah, no, I mean, it's all just guys that would have been in play at 22 or 28 who, if they could trade up again, I would like, you know, I'm not I'm not familiar with the dudes in the 50s, and I don't think uh, either yeah. one of us are the right experts mm -hmm. to be hitting on that stuff. But yeah, um, I hope I hope they walk away with at least one more guy. I think that, you know, I've crushed them for years for not taking advantage of even the 56 pick can become something. You got to try it. So um, hopefully they at least do that. And then, yeah, we got a real summer league team to watch now with Dunn and maybe another rookie and clearly going to be looking ahead to their G league team. And they have that roster somewhat set, but obviously can kind of add and manipulate it after the little draft that they did a, a while back. So should be fun to see, but that'll wrap us up for the day. Check out all the coverage over at bright side of the sun where Steven and co are churning things out every day as well. I'll be back with you as close to right after the second round ends. Remember, it's at one o'clock Arizona time, which means a lot of people aren't going to be able to watch it. But that also means you can just tune into Locked on Suns and I'll get you the lowdown on everything that happens, what the Suns do, what they get, who they get, and more. I'll talk to you then.